I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Great IG Live session that I am happy to share with you guys. One question I answered was how I would go about speed reading, and I give four or five different techniques that I use that are incredibly helpful to me. I also talk about how I would use the six U's of copywriting to sell the copper infused pajamas I'm currently wearing. And I talk about all other things, entrepreneurial, creativity, and so on. Enjoy. About selling them. If that's okay with you, because I know yeah. this has been an idea, but you know, it could be good for many people. It's a okay. good thing in general. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, uh, Janine and others. Lisa, how are you doing? And Robert, and so on. So we're going to talk about, obviously... You need to get more into it. Oh, I keep falling off the camera. Uh, we're going to talk about the news. Here, you go a little in front of me. I'll go a little back. Oh, I'm wearing my orange pajamas. I don't want everybody to see my pajama oh, pants. okay. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the news and what's been going on, and I hope everybody's been safe and sound and talk about some more business opportunities talk about the election and mm -hmm. answer some questions jay will send me uh jay you are not the first one try don't always try to be the best at everything let other people come <laughs> first occasionally but jay you do need to send me the ig live link and jay keep track of the questions i always see that there's more questions than you actually put on there but jay you're doing great don't worry uh, how's everybody doing? Last night at the, the cur in New York City, there was a curfew at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. And right around 8.30, we heard mm -hmm. all this noise. We looked out the window and all these people were running towards the front entrance of our building. And I don't know, there was about several thousand people walking past the building. There, yeah. You saw someone with a bat. Yeah, right? in their backpack. So, you know, if you listen to my podcast this morning with um, Eric Adams, so Eric Adams is the Brooklyn borough president. He's a good friend of ours. He was, he's African-American. He was, he was a police officer for 22 years, and then he got into politics. He, the Brooklyn borough presidency, he won with almost 92% of the vote. He's running for mayor next year. He, uh, uh, but again, he's, he's a good friend of ours. He came over for Thanksgiving, which fe feels like 20 <laughs> centuries ago. It feels I like know. before I was born even at this point. But Thanksgiving was just a few months ago, really. 
And um, I called him yesterday and I said, look, what's going on? We need to, uh, we, we need to understand, is there leadership? Is there a way that you see this as potentially ending? And how will it end? Because it made all of these protests, and I said to him, it made me think of 19, the last two times I could think of in history, it made me think of 1992, the LA protests where Rodney King, you know, the, the protests were, were devastating and a rioting, looting, and Rodney King, who was the victim in that case of police brutality, but he wasn't killed, fortunately, Rodney King stood up and said, can't we all get along? And that ended the protests. And then the time before that, historically, you know, obviously there's been other protests and everything, but on such a national scale was when Martin Luther King was assassinated and Robert F. Kennedy, uh, against the advice of his advisors, Robert F. Kennedy was in Indianapolis and he stood up and first off, he informed all the people at this campaign rally that Martin Luther King had been assassinated and you could hear people screaming when he told them this. And then he did this televised speech where he basically said, you know, I too have had a member of my family killed by a white man. And in that way, he was able to relate to everybody who was, who was protesting all around the country. And he calmed the situation down. And I asked Eric, what is going on? Like, A, who could calm the situation down? And like, is there a similar voice now? Because I don't believe there is either on a city level or governor level or national level or a civil rights level. And, uh, you know, what's going on with all this rioting? Because we're, we were seeing, you know, stores just a few blocks away were being, you know, smashed and broken into. Like, you know, if you see, a t you know, it doesn't, it seems like, oh, it's the big corporation Macy's, let's just steal everything in a Macy's or a Target or, you know, AutoZone or whatever. But, you know, you have to think like, you have to wonder why were they doing this? Like I saw one video, a cheesecake, by the way, this is, this seems frozen. So I don't know what's, oh, here we go. Not frozen. Uh, a cheesecake factory I saw was looted. Uh, oh yeah, there's, there's noise coming out of um, my <laughs> headphones. A, there was a cheesecake factory that was looted and uh, the woman, I saw a woman walking out with everything she stole from the Cheesecake Factory. It was a cheesecake. So, yeah. so could it be that people were just hungry and going into Target to grab like a bag of chips? <laughs> or like, I was just so funny to see, it was like a white woman carrying out a cheesecake and eating it. And that's why she broke the law and broke into a Cheesecake Factory was just to steal a cheesecake. It's like, mm -hmm. this is how, was this a result of the pandemic and the lockdown or was just people going crazy? But you know, one thing Eric said was, first off, let's, let, uh, let me deal with the issues of the protesters in a second. But Eric made the really good point that there are, there are other groups infiltrating and hiding amongst the protesters that do not have good intentions. Their intentions are the reverse of what the protesters want. They want to make it seem like the protesters are angrier than they are. They want to specifically call, cause problems with police. They want to hurt and fracture the government. And here's Eric Adams, who has walked for civil rights for the past 40 years. When he was a police officer for 22 years, he fought for, for reforms in law enforcement. And he's a real you know, hero in, in New York City. And that's why he is the Brooklyn Borough President. But he said that uh, they are aware and they've identified people who infiltrated the protests in New York City, who were, you know, specifically trying to kill people and disrupt the protests and riot. And so he and other leaders in New York City, I guess, and other leaders in law enforcement are trying to train the leaders of the protesters to recognize who is legit and who might be there for, for bad reasons. And, a lot, and, and you see in one of the videos, a lot of the people who've been um, doing the violent looting you know, they're all kind of covered in black and their whole face is covered is because they're white and mm -hmm. they're, they're in large part causing problems yeah. uh, for other reasons. So it's good. We, so I asked Eric, should we send our, our daughter wanted to go to the protest? And we asked him, should we send Lily to, should we let Lily go to the protest? And he even said at night, you can't, you gotta be careful. But during the day, 
you know, it's important for these protesters to listen and to talk to each other so they can move forward. Like this generation now, this younger generation needs its leaders and that's gonna start to develop. And these protests, if they're peaceful, will be a good starting point for many of these people. Now, I think we've hit peak protest. We're seeing the stock market is surging today. And, you know, a lot of the stocks that were related to law enforcement and personal protection are going down today, actually, because they were moving up during the protest. They're going down right now, like Axon, which is the body cameras, is going down. Um, but so I think we've gotten past the critical points, hopefully, although I see on Twitter a lot of these like oddly white organizers are still talking to their followers about, you know, this is what we need to do to keep protesting for a year, avoid arrest. If you see the police coming, go on to the next block. And it's on Twitter that you can find these people, but they're all anonymous and and weird. Literally. So, <laughs> oh, and that, yeah, their, their names are anonymous. Maybe different anonymous than you yeah, follow. Yeah, but they are involved as well. So, um, uh, let's see. I'm gonna, Jay has the IG Live link. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, uh, oh, someone asked last time uh, about, uh, speed reading. How do you speed read? And I'm not really a speed reader, but I will tell you my tips. Do you, do you, do I, have I ever told you my tips I, on speed reading? never told me. No. So for instance, let's say I have five podcasts in a week and each, I, I don't like to speed read. I like to read every single word because I love good writing. And the only way to get to be a better writer is you have to read a lot of good writing and study it and think about it. But on occasion I am forced to speed read. I've never really mentioned my <laughs> techniques before, but it, let's say I had, let's say I have, there are some weeks where I have eight, I have to do eight podcasts in a week and everybody's written a book. And some of the books are like 400 pages. She's seen me go through this. I have like a stack of books and I just have to read everything. And there's no way I can physically get through eight books in three days. And so here's what I do is I, first off, I have my waiter's pad next to me. So every time there's an important point or question, I'll write it down. But more importantly, here's what I try to do is I'll read, if I'm forced to speed read, I'll read the first sentence and last sentence of each paragraph. So that's all you need to do. And you'll probably read about four or five times as fast because here's what happens. People usually struggle over the first sentence in a mm -hmm. paragraph. It's like, what am I trying to say? Oh, I'm trying to say this. And then they try to close off the paragraph to summarize what they're trying to say. Right. And then all the meat in the paragraph is maybe just proof or it's usually, it's usually not good writing. Most, mm -hmm. by the way, most nonfiction writers are not good writers because let's say if they're writing about physics, they spent their whole lives getting good at physics, not getting good at writing. So I know for a fact, most nonfiction writers are not writing well. And so they're probably writing many extra sentences. A good writer uh, eliminates lots of sentences. So, I speed read when I know the writer is probably not that good and I could probably get away with reading the first and last sentence of each paragraph to know what the paragraph's about. Now, if there's something that raises a question, then I'll read a little deeper in the paragraph, you know, to kind of try to understand what they're saying. By the way, if I even want to read faster, you don't have to read the last sentence of a paragraph. Just read the first sentence of a paragraph because the first sentence, they basically say what they're going to say, like, you know, They'll say, uh, uh, you know, the Big Bang happened 13.2 billion years ago. And then the paragraph will be like, we know this because the Hubble Space Telescope calculates the distance to the cosmic radiation in the background. And that's noise from the Big Bang. So that's the paragraph. But the only thing I really needed to know was the first sentence. The Big Bang happened 13.2 or 13.7 billion years ago. So if you just read the first sentence of a paragraph, your speed reading. Now let's say you have to even read faster than that. You can get away with probably reading the first couple of paragraphs and the last couple of paragraphs of every chapter, and that will be enough. And even on top of that, re read the first chapter very closely because that will summarize the whole book and read the last chapter very closely because when you talk on a podcast about the book, if you reference the last chapter, you build up trust with the, I'm, I'm just saying this is, I rarely do this. This is just the down and dirty. If I'm pressed for time, this is rare. 
But if I want to kind of build trust with the podcast guest, I'll read, I'll make sure I read the last chapter very thoroughly so I can refer to it. I'll even read the acknowledgments at the end and I'll refer to the acknowledgments. And then they'll say to themselves, man, you really read it if you're asking me about the acknowledgments. And by the way, 99% of the time I do really read it, but I'm just saying if you're in super fast, you need to do something really fast. Again, the first trick, read the first and last sentence of each paragraph. Trick number two, if you need to read faster, just read the first sentence of every paragraph. Trick number three, read the first few paragraphs and last few paragraphs of each chapter. Trick number four, just read the first chapter and the last chapter and always refer to the last chapter in the podcast. Then you create this enormous impression that you've read it. Finally, have your waiter's pad next to you and take notes on everything you think that's important. Now, by the way, you're never gonna look at those notes again. I don't read off my notes when I'm doing a podcast, but it helps me to remember the important points that the author was trying to make. And it's hopeful, helpful to look at right before I go into the podcast. Because usually as soon as the podcast starts, even now after doing like a thousand podcasts, I'm so incredibly nervous. Sometimes I actually forget the title of the book that I just finished reading. Even if I've read completely the whole book, I'll forget the title. I'm, I've had situations where I've forgotten the podcast name. I like Joe Biden, the podcast, and I forget the guest's name before when I sit down to do the podcast with him. Then I get really nervous and I try to Google something. Oh, excuse me, I was one point I wanted to look up or something like that. But I'm just being honest. Most of the time I read the entire book. I'm very familiar with the career. I watch all the podcasts. I, I listen to talks that they've given. Like mostly, most of the time I over-prepare and I think I have a reputation as a podcaster for over-preparing. But sometimes if I have to do eight, nine, 10 podcasts in a week, I can't over-prepare and I can't, um, I can't do everything, which is why I'm loving these IG lives. So that's how I do a podcast. Uh, by the way, you all should start doing a podcast. Like here, let me, Jay could correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, because Jay's not gonna believe what I'm gonna say. But if you wanna do a podcast, you could do it with just your iPhone. Yeah. Just, you, there's a voice recorder on your iPhone. I could just be go on a, taking a walk with Robin. And I could say, Robin, what do you think about mm -hmm parenting and we could just go back and forth and I'm interviewing her and then now I've got a recording and I could upload it to there's there's a, there's a website called Omni O M is in Mary N is in Nancy Y is in youth Omni.com or Omni.fm one of those and you just upload you register your podcast there you upload each one and now you have a professional podcast there's really um there's really not much more. Now you can then say, well, I need guests on my podcast. Well, you may want to reconsider. Like, it's kind of boring to me now, all the podcasts that are starting, that are interviewing guests. Like, who gives a shit about yet another podcast with guests? Like, that's why I have some podcasts now with guests. Sometimes it's just Robin and me, and those are my favorites now. And I'm going to start another uh, episode type uh, Side Hustle Fridays, probably we'll start not this Friday, but next Friday. I'll do a 10 minute episode with just the side hustle of the week. And Which that's will all. be us on our phone, probably just talking. Oh, that, that's the side hustle <laughs> of the week? Well, it depends if we can make money doing that. It, can we make money just talking on our phone? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe if you do a podcast, just talking on the phone. You know what you should do? This would be good. I'm going to record every conversation I have on the phone for the next week and unbeknownst to all the people I talk to on the phone, I'm just gonna upload it to a podcast, which by the way, is legal in New York State. Uh, you, you, in New York, every state is different, but in New York State, you do not have to inform the other person that you're recording their conversation. Oh, that's crazy. I don't know if you can upload it to a podcast, but what are people gonna do? Sue? Right. <laughs> so, um, will we be guests on your podcast? We're guests right now on your podcast. Ask, <laughs> ask questions and record the, the answers. Um, so, Robin, I want to I want to take an idea that you've given me <laughs> okay. and share it with the audience. We've talked about this a little okay. before, but I have a reason for uh, that I want to okay. share. So Robin comes to me with this idea that copper. Um, I don't know. Why, why don't you explain what? Why is copper so important? Well, it's it's an antiviral substance, so it kills all you know viruses and bacteria. So like, why isn't silverware copperware? Because it would be cheaper, right? Right. Copper is cheaper than silver. Right, but um, with silver, it has to be moist to uh, to work for some reason. So 
That's why it's But copper cheap. works moist. But copper works moist and it works dry. So why yes. don't people eat with copperware instead of silverware? Silverware also is antiviral, right? But it needs it, to be moist. It, it, right. So that's why there's silverware. And you yeah. can even have goldware, but it's 60 times more expensive than right. silverware. Well, they used to. I mean, I don't know. The Egyptians used to use it. I mean, a lot of different, you know, cultures. Copper or gold? Copper. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. But they just don't now. Just because no. it's ugly looking. I, I guess. I don't know, but we'll, we'll have someone set. So, Florida. so I wanted to, so I Googled this, is copper antiviral? And I found a whole bunch of studies. So for instance, this is from the Smithsonian Magazine, April 14th, 2020. And it says, uh, what does it say about copper? Copper's virus killing powers were known even to the ancients. So the mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2 virus endures for days on plastic or metal, but disintegrates mm -hmm. right after landing on copper surfaces Here's why, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it goes on and on about copper. So if you, uh, uh, if you infuse, oh, so by the way, um, just a mic on their phone. Yes, if you wanna do a podcast, you only need a mic on your phone and you could do a podcast. Am I right, Jay? So yes. And so, so, uh, so the idea that Robin had, why don't you explain the idea that you had? Well, which one? There's a lot of them. The pajamas. Oh, well, the pajamas. Yeah, you just uh, find a source where you can buy the uh, the fabric, with, which is impregnated with uh, the copper, or uh, and then impregnated. That sounds sexy. Yeah. Well, it's is that what they, they call infuse it? Infuse it. Okay, infuse it. But it impregnated too. It depends on uh, what what process. So uh -huh. when it's coated, anyway. Um, and then you just find uh, you know somebody to to make. You know, give them a sample and then find them. I don't know. They you can, can make design, it and they can design it. So they these copy these copper pajamas that we got, they're orange. Do they have to be orange because of the they copper? Don't. No, no, no. Because like these them. are the only color they sell. No, uh, not an orange. And it's like sixty dollars. How much do you think it would cost to make these pajamas? Uh, gosh, I don't know. I haven't even. So let's say it costs twenty dollars. Let's say it costs twenty dollars to make copper infused pajamas. You could have like a nifty little design. Maybe a little logo, like you could put stripes mm -hmm. on a shoulder. You could put a little logo here, yeah. like the antiviral, right. you know, the Wuhan pajamas or whatever. I don't know. And uh, uh, now you want to sell it. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is I think this is an interesting product idea, but I want to give this as an example of copywriting. And so a few weeks ago, I talked to you about why copywriting the copywriting just to define it is is a way to write something that like an ad so that you that you convince people to buy what you're trying to sell and copywriting is more I can't just say buy this because it fights diseases because that's not interesting enough for for most people to say oh okay I'll buy it I, I, I'll just trust this guy buy it. so copywriting is this way to write using all these cognitive biases that will convince people to, 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 to buy what you're selling. So let's say I was trying to sell these corona, these copper infused pajamas. And so I'm going to describe the six U's, which I've used before to describe the import, all the, you need to have these, all six of these U's in your letter. And first thing I want to explain is, um, when you're copywriting a letter, you want it to be a long, long letter because there's a cognitive bias. If someone reads, you ever get those ads like, here's how you make a million dollars tomorrow. You say, oh, I'll click on that and read it. And then you start reading and it's like, oh, when are they gonna get to the point? When are they gonna get to the price? How can I buy this? Sometimes it might take you a half hour to read. These are like 30 or 40 page yeah, but, letters. But don't you think people though, I mean, after a while, you just stop doing it. Yeah. It's like, I stop. Yeah, yeah, you stop because you're not the buyer. So anybody who finishes, will buy mm -hmm. because the cognitive bias is their brain is telling them, man, I just, re I'm, I, I must have read that whole letter for a reason. I guess I should buy. But don't you think though, if, I mean, I'm interested and I'm in there for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, don't you think that if they shorten it a bit and then they get to the point that they may have more? That is a great more? question. So when I first started using a copywriter to sell products, I hated the copywritten letters. It was, they were just disgusting. I hated the, the four U's, the six U's and whatever. And I, and so I complained 
to the guy who was in writing all these letters. And he said, listen, do you think your message is sincere and authentic and honest? And I said, yes, but that's why, why can't I just write something that says, this is what it does, you should buy it. And he said, okay, why don't you try that? And we'll compare, we'll go, we'll split this email list in half and we'll send your email to half and we'll send the copywriting email to the other half. The copywriting email sold like 10 times as many. I'm a good writer and the copywritten email, which was disgusting, sold 10 times as many. So if you want your message to be heard and if you want, and if you believe in your product and you want your product to be sold, copywriting is a better technique for selling it. Mm -hmm. um, after too long, I leave the video and just don't want to buy it. That's correct. Yeah. The people, Me too. The, but, but you would never, chances are you never would have bought anyway. That's the thing. So mm -hmm. the, 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 the longness of the video and the writing is what gets people to buy because part of what makes you buy is the fact that you sat through Invested. the whole email. Like a lot of people who say, oh, I'll get back to this later, or, or uh, the, a lot of people just read a short email and say, oh, this was interesting. I'm gonna finish reading all my emails and then I'll get back to this. They never get back to it. Someone who sits through the entire letter, they have this cognitive bias to buy. Interesting. And, you know, they get more and more, the more you read, the more details you get about the product. But let's talk about the you, the six U's that have to be in. Let's say I'm selling the copper pajamas. Mm -hmm. So. The first you is urgency. So how would you make, if you were writing this letter to sell copper infused pajamas, I would, I would say it's urgent for two reasons. One is, hey, Dr. Fauci just said second wave might be coming back in August or September, which he did say, mm -hmm. so I'm not, I'm being sincere. Mm -hmm. And if you buy while still in June, you know, we guarantee that supplies will last through June. And if you buy now, you get 15% off. Mm -hmm. So that puts urgency in there. And then you have to say another you is unique. So you have to say, you know, we've studied 60,000 types of pajamas. None of them are copper infused. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, uh, you know, copper is good for antiviral and so on. So, so which one, oh, that was unique. Oh, we're, we're, this is the only place you could buy copper infused pajamas that really are infused all through the pajamas or mm -hmm. whatever the, the man, manufacturing technique is. Then you have to, you have to offer unquestionable, unquestionable proof that this is a good product. And so, um, uh, DJ Easy Wheezy is, is asking, is this an ad? No, this is not an ad. We don't have the copper infused pajamas. We haven't made them yet. But if I were, I'm explaining to everybody, if you were to make an ad and it was a copywritten letter, and I'll explain how to, you would use a copywritten letter. These are the U's that I would, you have to, you have to follow these six U's in your letter. So you have to say it's urgent. So that means buy while supplies last, 15% off, get your uh, copper infused pajamas before the second wave hits. Uh, and then you have to, you always have to be ultra specific. So uh, that's another you. So I'm skipping unique for a second, <laughs> but ultra specific, you have to say, why is it there a second wave coming? Well, Dr. Fauci on, on May 15th, 2020 at a press conference at the white house, Dr. Fauci said there's going to be a second wave by September. I don't know if he said that or not, but let's just say he said that. And then unique, these are the only clothes on the universe you can get that are fully copper infused. You can't get them anywhere else. Unquestionable proof. You say like, I just Googled in Smithsonian magazine on April 14th, 2020, they, here's a quote from Smithsonian magazine. They tested copper on the coronavirus. Coronavirus disintegrated instantly. This is why the ancient Egyptians had copper doorknobs. Didn't they have, don't they have copper doorknobs here? Isn't that the reason for copper doorknobs? Yeah, they used to do that. They used to be popular. They're not popular now? No, not really. Mm -mm. So, okay. Well, the reason they have others materials now that are a lot cheaper. The reason there's copper infused, or the reason that we had copper doorknobs at some point is that they're antiviral, antibacterial, and so on. So you give all sorts of unquestionable proof. You have to get ultra specific. I already mentioned that you, mm -hmm. but maybe talk specifically using our patent, patented, patented copper infusion process. And then we just call up the factory where we make the pajamas and get the exact details of their process. That's ultra specific, uh, useful. Well, they're useful because you can sleep in them and you could say 35% of Americans have trouble sleeping. Um, and then when we started using these copper infused pajamas, 
you know, here's what James A. had to say. Oh my gosh, I never slept better in the pa through the whole pandemic. This was the be best I've ever slept. You know, that would have to be true. So we'd have to give a bunch of people our pajamas and test and make sure that that's true. But it, if you make sure it's useful and, and you know, there's, it doesn't really cost you anything to wear these pajamas versus another pair of pajamas. So you might as well use the pajamas that have antiviral properties so you avoid getting sick. And so that's useful. Um, let me see if I'm missing any, any use. I talked about urgency, unique, useful, ultra Pacific, user friendly. Oh uh, yeah, that there it's user friendly. All you got to do like any other pair of pajamas is just put them on. Here's what I don't understand too. And this is very important for my, um, understanding of fashion. Why do people wear any other clothes, but pajamas? Because all other clothes are uncomfortable. Like a <laughs> suit know. is uncomfortable. Like I don't, I hate suits. I like the jacket, nobody wears a jacket, like a suit jacket, unless they're going to an office meeting. Mm -hmm. You never say, oh, I just want to relax at a picnic. I'm going to wear my suit, my tuxedo jacket. Like no <laughs> one says that. So like all other clothes are uncomfortable, except pajamas are like so soft and comfortable. You could sleep, they're so comfortable you could sleep in them. Yeah. So I kind of think pajamas should be worn 24 hours a day. So that's part of my <laughs> unique story here. Um, uh, uh, and, and the user friendliness, it's so user friendly um, that I want to wear it all the time. And then of course I got to unquestionable proof. Pajamas are better for sleeping. Copper, according to Smithsonian Magazine, is better for uh, antiviral. So see, wouldn't you buy a pair of copper infused pajamas and then, uh, uh, and then wear it all day long. I've been wearing my, we got a couple of pairs of copper pajamas. <laughs> Actually, that's a lie. I only got one pair. And I've been wearing it since I got it. We Sunday night, we had a comedy show. I wore my I copper too. infused pajamas. And you know what? I think they're pretty ugly. Like they're kind of this yeah. bright orange. So I hope you can, we can make it different colors. It's funny because they're silky. And you were wearing them last night when we were taking pictures of the protesters. We're in our gated community looking out and you've got these orange pajamas, silky pajamas. You yeah, they look silky, but they're not. Right. They're but, coppery. But, and then you, you look pretty, yeah. I looked pretty? Well, you, you looked pretty, you know, privileged. I, oh, I'm wearing my silk yeah. pajamas in the, <laughs> behind the gates. Even Lily was like, I don't think this is a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Our kids were like so embarrassed, they like backed off. And the protesters were stopping protesting and they were taking pictures of me. Like I was, <laughs> the one that they were going to go after later. So, uh, it was funny. Um, so anyway, that's, Ugh. that's copywriting. example. So the question is now, where would I use that letter? I can't just send that to all letter to all my friends. So there are plenty. If you Google renting email lists, there are plenty of email lists out there that you could rent for like 50 cents, a, a, a name and, or some number. Like you could rent a list with 50,000 names on it or rent a small list, rent a list with a thousand names on it, mm -hmm. send your letter and see how many convert into customers. If, if it's less than two or 3%, try to convert, uh, try to rewrite your letter and, and test again on another thousand, try to get it up to four or five or 6% of the list buying, you know, or, or test a bunch of times and tweak different things, compare different emails to each other. So you, everything about copywriting is also about testing. Testing is the key to any success in business. If you have a product idea and you have a way to market it, figure out a small way to test and then, and then test 20 different emails. The tests that work, put more money in, buy bigger lists, buy a bigger part of the list you just bought from, and then send out the email and be ready to, um, to deliver it. Now, the question is, do you need to make your copper infused pajamas before you send out this email? No, include the word custom. These are custom made copper infused pajamas. People, when people see the word custom, they are aware that it's going to take three, four five weeks to get delivered. Uh, these took three or four or five weeks to get delivered. And you know, if no pajamas sell, just refund everybody their money. And if pajamas, if they do sell, then order them from the factory and send them out. So that's a good way to test an idea if it works.
These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game-like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll sign up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. 
boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. They were wanting to know where you can get the lists. Um, that's a good question. So right now, there are probably a lot of people, probably you get lists all day long. Look at your spam box or, or forget your spam box because those are the bad email lists. Look at the emails you get all day long. I get emails like 20% off at such and such, you know, you know, publisher or whatever. They, those, whoever you're getting emails from, they have probably have huge lists. You could rent those lists or there's like, there's a news magazine. They're no longer a magazine, but they're just an email list company, Newsmax. You could buy Newsmax's list and Newsmax, uh, they cater to like a conservative uh, Republican audience. You could find, depending on who you think your audience is, you could find publications that could cater to that audience mm-hmm. and your demographic. And you could rent their list and they will say, okay, we'll schedule you for June 15th send us the the email and you send exactly the email you want them to use and they will use it. And, Mm -hmm. and, and then you, 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 you create a landing page. The landing page might have the the same email, or it might just be like order here, put in your discount code, Newsmax, get your 15% off and boom. Um, that's really cool. I wonder if I, if I Google, uh, uh, rent email lists, what comes up? Uh, okay, the first thing that comes up is www.exactdata.com. And so what they say is, buy email lists now, reach your target audience, email marketing lists, need a business list. So just Googling um, rent email lists and you don't even have to build your own email list, use their list, but then test it. So let's say, okay, we have, let's say they come back to you and they say, well, we have 3 million names, but it's gonna cost you $10,000 to rent the list. Say, look, I need to test your list first. I'll give you $100 to test it on 1,000 names. And I'm gonna test five different emails. So I need five different email lists of 1,000 random names from your list. And, and, then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna double down. I'm gonna buy your whole list with the copywritten email that works the best. Also, you could test, here's another thing to test. Test video versus email. So instead of sending the, 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 the email, make a video of the email. So do have an email of someone wearing the pajamas saying the entire email and that if somebody watches that whole video, they're going to buy, have a man and a woman on it. Um, And if someone watches the whole video, again, they have a cognitive bias. Oh, I just sat here and watched this video about pajamas for 40 minutes. Uh, I learned this. I didn't, your brain's going to tell you, you didn't waste your time. Mm -hmm. And so what the only action you can do to prove to your brain that you didn't waste your time is buying the pajamas. So that's why as a cognitive bias, if you watch the whole video, you will buy. That's why it doesn't matter if you or you or you don't watch the whole video, you weren't the intended audience to begin with. The next technique is you make it into a webinar where there's like uh, a, a girl asking the inventor of the copper infused pajamas questions. Like yeah. this is, you know, I'm an epidemiologist on Twitter and I'm saying right. this. So right. that is that is the uh, lesson. Wally, I owe you a phone hey, call. We miss you. I can't and see anything, so it's hard for me to I see just saw, I just saw anything. Wally's name pop up. Uh, Wally, we want to have you over. Uh, we, now that the coronavirus is over because everyone's been, everyone's been, by the way. Yeah, really, by the way. By the way, where, so. Where is coronavirus disease? Well, here's the bullshit headline of the day. <laughs> we're gonna go, we're gonna skip to the bullshit headline of the day. Is it safe to go to a pool, the beach, or a park? <laughs> a doctor offers guidance as coronavirus coronavirus distancing measures lifted. So are you kidding me? That just came out. That's on CNN. <laughs> Is it safe to go to the beach or a pool? Uh, excuse me. There are 50,000 people right now in Washington Square Park. 
like jammed next yeah. to each other, literally spitting on each other yeah. and, and fighting hugging. and bleeding and hugging, hugging. Yeah. And, and smashing windows with their bare hands. So maybe you should ask if how these people could be safe from coronavirus. Like, I think the woman reading like a John Grisham novel at the beach all by herself <laughs> is, is at zero risk for coronavirus. So particularly if she's wearing a copper infused bikini <laughs> and On so, a copper infused towel. <laughs> so that was the BS Jack D Dylan. I do love CNN. I don't know why I should probably find it. I've, I've used other websites, but it seems like every day CNN has the bullshit headline of the day. So I just stick with it. Also, CNN just rejected a TV show idea I had. So screw them. <laughs> Cosmopol I go to Cosmopolitan. I figured, OK, if CNN has the BS headline of the day, what will the honest headline yeah. of the day be at my favorite website? You know, I'm going to I'm going to write Cosmopolitan. I want to write for Cosmopolitan. <laughs> so here. So now this is good. This was amazing to me that this was the top headline at Cosmopolitan.com. I had just read the BS headline at CNN, which is, is how do I social distance safely at, say, safely at a beach? Here is the this, real truth. It's I true. go to cosmopolitan.com. This was the very first headline. You can go there right it's now. It's great. It's perfect. How to protect yourself while protesting, whether from the police or coronavirus. Now, Boom. Right. That is a useful headline. It's not BS. Right. It's, it's here's it's the suggestions. Useful. Wear a mask. By the way, the people actually breaking into stores, they oh, wore masks yeah. <laughs> all over their face. They were very well protected. Protect your body and, and, and just say, always wear clothing that covers your skin, not just to protect you from coronavirus, mm -hmm. but also from pepper spray. They say it right here. They're, right, they're, right, they're thinking right. of everything. Yeah. Like if you're, you're protected. Right. Be smart with your phone, not only because your phone can get germs, but because with your phone, they can see what protest you were in. The government can see. Mm -hmm. So Cosmopolitan's thinking ahead. If you ever run for president, you don't want your phone to say, oh, but we did contact tracing and we saw that you were at Washington Square looting the Target or NYU or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, That's so funny. Uh, and have a plan if you get arrested. So you're not gonna see that on a coronavirus article, but Cosmopolitan yeah. says it like it is. If you go on a protest, you might get arrested. So what's the plan if you can't take your phone? Like you have to be able to call somebody. Unless, do they give you a phone to, well, call, you know, to... Well, uh, let's see. Let's see, what, <laughs> let's see what they say. It's important not to protest alone in the event something that happens to you. Yes. Um, you also want to make sure to write down emergency contact numbers, a legal hotline, a trusted friend on your arm with a permanent marker. That so this sense. way, if you get like hosed down, yeah, yeah. then you still right. have it on a permanent mm -hmm. marker. And then, I don't know, you That's if you are arrested, you are allowed one phone call. We used to do that with the kids anyway, with a permanent marker. We used to write... Their, our phone number in case they were lost. Like if we knew we were going somewhere and. That's so, that's so funny. That's such a good idea. Like I remember being like four years old and my parents would just shove me out, like <laughs> go play, make friends. And I would like wander ac across the highway. Like there was a highway, a, a couple of blocks. Like I was, I literally remember being Aww. three years old and like least... dodging cars over a highway. And then my dad was driving around to try to find me. I had a big wheel. Oh. So I rode oh. a big wheel across. The highway. Even back then, they didn't write. Poorly. They didn't write that. Yeah, even back then, they didn't write down my phone number. But by the way, Mine the didn't either. if you're arrested, though, they will. Uh, they'll take your phone, but you're allowed a phone call. So that's why you have to write it down. Yeah, yeah, no, a it a friend's number. It makes sense. So once again, Cosmopolitan with the reasonable, important headline of the day. I love CNN. That. I'm gonna read it now. So tone deaf is asking today, what do you do? How do you keep yourself safe from coronavirus at the pool? Well, if you're at the yeah, pool, on. like, yeah. just just don't do anything. There's chlorine in the pool. That's probably pretty good for yeah. you. And don't forget, you, there's copper tone suntan lotion, right? So <laughs> don't, doesn't suntan lotion have copper in it? They do. Zinc. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Why is it called copper tone? Because it's gonna make you look coppery. That's uh, the look that you oh, call that. Is, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Coppertone, well, let's just see. Coppertone is the leading brand. What are the, what are the things in it? There's Coppertone Girl. Oh, uh, it doesn't say. Uh, there's no copper in it. That's 
funny. Someone asked me, uh, or they were saying something about brass, but and brass is copper, but it is has like zinc and other yeah other type of brass. For make sure something is on the periodic table of elements. So brass is not an element, whereas copper is one of the, those special elements that you know formed within I mean, a trillionth have, of a second. It does have copper in it, but it has copper in it, but it's, but it's a mixture. Zinc of, yeah. So it's got like aluminum. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Got it's got a nickel. All these things: nickel, <laughs> copper. Like a penny has has yeah, nickel what are, in it. Was a penny copper or bronze? It's copper, but but well, it's but it's mixed with nickel. I yeah, and I, and, I, I, I think. Oh, here this was a side hustle. I don't know if it exists anymore. But if you collect older pennies, they have more. The copper in yeah, those pennies is worth more than a cent. So you can right. melt it all down. But I, I don't know well, if that actually works or not. Which is interesting because when I lived in Ghana, we had no phone service because they would steal the copper wiring for the phones. Really? Yeah, yeah. So they 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 do that all over. Protesters? No. Just, just to take the money, and they need money, you know. So they go, they go up and sneak up and cut all the phone lines. Smart, it's a smart idea. And then one time, a funny thing about the phone lines is that when we first moved into this house, apparently the person there before like owed money on on electricity, and they said, if you don't pay this today, we're gonna come and and we're gonna cut the line. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, we have a, you know, a uh, what do you call it, a, a generator. So I thought, not a big deal. But uh, they came and actually physically cut the line. Really? They climbed up the ladder and they just cut it. And so when you paid, how, <laughs> like, do, they, wow, that's how really, do they put the line together? How do you they, do that? I don't know. They just, but it's all like jumbled up like this with all these. I'm like, I don't even know where they, how they know which line to cut because it's like this huge mess of entangled. Do you ever feel like, it remind, like do you ever feel like society is, is built? Like they're, they're done. Like they made all the electric lines, they made all the tunnels mm. and bridges and subways and buildings, and now they're done. Because like, I feel like they're not doing anything new because I feel like if I yeah. went back in time a thousand years, people might, people, maybe everybody, like the Knights of the Round Table would be, we got to kill this guy. <laughs> uh, he's, he, he's weird or whatever. And I'll say, no, 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 wait, I'm from the future. I could help you. Right. Like, I'm from 2020. I'll help. But then if I think about it, like, what can I do? Like, I can't really well, invent. Do you know how to invent anything that would help somebody a thousand years ago? I can't even make I can't even tell them how to yeah, make a pencil. Yeah, because there's like so many things it took to get to that point. Yeah. Right. Like, could you make a like, book? Like, you know, could you that, print a book? Right. How does the printing press work? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I can't right? make we, a computer. I could we program. Be able to print I with could, those printers back then. Yeah, a thousand years ago. <laughs> you can't make a printer. Would you know how to, I can't. We're not good at calligraphy. <laughs> would you know how to cook anything? Like I can't cook anything without an oven. Like, would you know how to make an oven or cook? Well, you just do fire. I can do that. Do you know how to make a fire? Yeah. How do you make a fire? Well, you get. You do you know, know how to make a fire? Yeah, you, you, you can get, um, it's, um, what is it? It's a stone that you use and you can flint, flint. Yeah, do you know how to find a flint stone? Like if you were in, Flintstone. <laughs> if you were at the night of the round table, and you're and they're about to kill you. You'd say, "Wait, I'm from a thousand years in the future. Get me some flint, pronto, and I'll show you the future." I think you could use any. I think it's in a lot of stones. Have you ever actually made a fire? Yeah. Really? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I have never made a fire. I learned that in um, yeah survival training. In I, I would not be able to make clothes. I would not be able to make a bed. I would not be able to cook because I can't make a fire. Okay. I would not be able to tell you, uh, you oh, like, here are some berries. Uh, are these poisonous or not? Let's eat them and try. I have, I have, why are you asking me? I have no idea. I buy my blueberries at the store. <laughs> Don't you guys have stores? You are. You... Oh, 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 oh. You are a tell, tell, us what, tell us what a store is. Can you make a store? Sure. Do you have money? <laughs> make us money. Okay, do you have some copper? Here's some copper. Okay, well, how do I, I can't, how do you turn a copper in, into a penny or a coin? You need fire. Like, how do they put a face, like, even in Rome, they It all starts with fire, honey. Like, so they, when they made a face, like Julius Caesar, they put him on, like, a Roman yeah. piece of silver. Mm -hmm. Would you know how to do that? I could figure it out. Oh, well, I can't figure that out. What, what could, what can you guys, what, uh, yeah, eBay, we could use eBay. <laughs> what could you guys make 
If you were if you were forced to go to ancient Rome and they were about to Wouldn't kill that you, would be kind of cool. That would be a really a cool. That'd be a good reality show. show. I know. Um, okay, I'm gonna ans answer some more questions now that we've. Um, Wouldn't that be oh, a great reality say, show? I think we should do that. Good. Lots of. Uh, uh, that is a good reality show. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Uh, uh, um, is that a space shuttle cockpit hanging in the back? Yes, it is. We're actually in space. Yeah. We're in SpaceX right now. Could you imagine those guys who launched into <laughs> yeah. space on the Dragon? They're, right before the I, protest. <laughs> as soon as they broke free of the atmosphere, they're like, right. they're like sending a message back to Houston. Thank God we got out of that shithole just in time. Don't ever send us back. Um, oh, this is an interesting question. Is it, is it possible to have real change without some destruction? And, you know, it's such an interesting question because the answer is yes, but you look at the times of biggest change. There was the American Revolution and then the US happened. There was the Civil War and slavery ended. Um, but I don't think in general you have to have destruction to have real change. So for instance, the internet, you're not, you're, we're all using the internet right now and there was no destruction that happened that led to the rise of the internet. Uh, so computers didn't require, uh, well, computers actually required World War II for the fastest development, just like nuclear energy required World War II for the fastest development. But if you look at it, like the airplane was not invent, well, the airplane was invented call it roughly 1908 and there was no war happening right then. It was not created for military use initially. Now it developed quickly, like the jet developed during World War II. Trains did not develop for military reasons. Trains developed so you could transport people from New York to California or Chicago or whatever. So uh, trains were developed. So tra most of transportation, I feel, was not developed out of destruction. So you had, mm -hmm. since 1800, you know, in 1800, it, well, in, in 1800, it took Thomas Jefferson six days to go from Philadelphia to Baltimore. And now it would, it's just one train stop on the Amtrak. You can, it, it, you can go to the moon and back faster than it took Thomas Jefferson to go from Philadelphia to Baltimore. So a lot of transport, you know, in the past 200 years, we've seen such a great innovation in transportation that did not involve destruction. Now we're seeing more innovation in bits than atoms. So where's the innovations in the internet? It's in AI, it's in social networking, for better or for worse, social media, CNN.com. This is where, you know, we've innovated with bits rather than atoms and that did not require uh, disruption or destruction. You know, Tesla working on electric cars, that did not require destruction. So I don't think, I do not think change requires destruction. In fact, destruction, could move things back. So the dark ages in the early part of the last millennium, the dark ages occurred because of destruction. So it was the downfall of the Roman empire. It was all these, uh, you know, wars and the, the, the economy didn't really come back until the printing press and the Renaissance. So the, uh, innovation creates change, but, but, but destruction does not create change. So, but in order, and in fact, this is a really important point. In order to have innovation, you need to have free speech. You need people to discuss and exchange ideas so that they could develop new ideas. So most great ideas were, were created because I'm, maybe, I'll, maybe I'm a scientist and I read a paper that came out of Moscow and another paper that came out of Berlin. And now let's say I'm sitting at a job as a clerk in the Swiss patent office and my name is Albert Einstein, I could come up with the theory of relativity. If Einstein had not already read papers by Lorenz and other physicists, prominent physicists at that time, he never would have had the theory of relativity, which ultimately led to nuclear energy and so on. So it's actually the reverse of destruction. You need free speech, you need free exchange of ideas. Ideas evolve like people do. So how do people evolve? People of different features have sex with each other and they have babies. Those babies carry some mutations. The mutations that are the strongest survive. It's the same thing with ideas. Ideas have to have sex with each other in order to have baby ideas. The most successful ideas will, will grow up and, and change the world and, and they themselves will have uh, ideas, sex with other ideas. So the internet was developed 
and then the internet combined with the idea of mail. We had idea sex and that's how you have the first email was sent around 1972. And then the internet with microcomputers and, and with images and now you have the World Wide Web. So all we, none of these things would have happened with in in a destructive environment. There had to be, it was during a period where, you know, in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, we went from the Cold War and what was called detente. There was a sort of a, ver a kind of peace between the United States and the Soviet Union. And then ultimately the web came about when there was complete peace and it was the most peaceful time in the past 200 years. And that's how the internet started to flourish. So I would think it's the opposite of destruction that creates change. It's the free exchange of ideas. That's why if you have an idea, share it with people. Do not do not be like, oh no, I can't tell anyone my idea. Share your idea with as many people as possible because that's how you'll get even better ideas. And that's what the programmers do too. That's what John does. Yeah, open the whole open source programming environment. Um, what do I do with books after I finish uh, reading? Yeah, I want to uh, know what you do with them too. I, they're usually just that's lying around thing. until Robin picks them up. But uh, I used to, when I had no belongings, I would, I had a Kindle. So I would read all my books on the Kindle. So they would just stay there. Now I just put books. We have like four or five different bookcases and I put books on a bookcase. I kind of save the books. And, and, and by the way, if I read a good book, it's a guarantee I'm going to reread it yeah. because, and I've said this before here, when you read a really good book, how much do you think you remember of that book? Like if you read a good book, how much do you remember of it? Yeah, not much, but I do. I keep all my favorites too, because so, I always go back to them. I remember I asked, I, I, I used to think I, maybe I remember 10%. And then I asked Stephen Dubner who wrote Freakonomics mm -hmm. and he said, oh, maybe I remember 1%. Mm -hmm. And I was like, actually, that's probably more accurate. I probably remember 1% even of a really good book. So I very often reread, there's very few great, great books. So I reread heavily great fiction, great nonfiction, because that's the only way I'm going to learn. If I just go on to like all the other books that are kind of crappy or not good, I'm not going to learn anything. So only through rereading books and taking notes, uh, do you learn anything? Maybe I'll learn one or two things the first time and they'll really make an impression. But like, let's say a book like Sapiens, I've probably read that yeah, 10 times. And my favorite fiction books, I've probably read two or 300 times each. Mm -hmm. My absolute favorite book, a collection of short stories about a drug addict called Jesus Son by Dennis Johnson. I've read that at least 300 times. I used to read that book once a week for about 20 years. Now so reading it. yeah, now our daughter's yeah. uh, reading it. So, uh, uh, and then bad books, I try not to read at all. <laughs> um, another question. Uh, uh, where can I learn about running online businesses like the ones sold on Flippa? That's a really good question. So I, the other day, I, uh, it was last Friday, I talked about, and Jay, has that podcast gone out yet? So I talked about the $10 million idea of the week, uh, which was buying small online businesses, improving them, combining them, using the cash flow to buy more. And I gave all the reasons why that how to quickly turn that into a $10 million idea. And there was a kind of a, some nuances to that, but it's a good question. How, if you just buy one of those businesses, how do you run it? Well, uh, this is a great question. The person to ask that question to is the seller. So ask the seller, what is how much time per day, week, month, do they spend running their website and, and what tools do they use? They will tell you because they want to sell their site to you. So during the what's called due diligence, ask those questions to the seller. Every site is different. So if it's just a content site, maybe you write articles every day, or maybe you cut and paste articles from other sites. If it's an e-commerce site, I don't know. You have to ask someone um, who you always have to ask the seller. Don't be afraid to ask extremely yeah. detailed. I, I, when I was, so when I first started being a venture capitalist, in 1999 or early 2000, I, ra I raised a $200 million venture capital fund. And I was really naive. I was like 31, 32 years old. I, ha I had no idea what I was doing. And one of my partners and I would go to these meetings and he would ask the dumbest questions. We'd go to these meetings of companies that wanted to raise money. And he, his name was Mark, Mark Canelli. And he would ask the dumbest, stupidest questions. And I would think to myself, oh my gosh, this guy is such an idiot. He is so stupid. Like, why is he asking? These people are gonna think he's an idiot. But then I realized I was the idiot. He was the smart person. 
he would just sit there and he would say, pretend I'm five years old. Explain your business to me as if I'm five years old. And they would say something like, no, 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 I'm five years old, even simpler than that. And so they would be forced to explain their businesses to him and to me as if we were five years old. I would be embarrassed the whole time, which is why he was a good investor and I wasn't because I was barely listening to them. I was too busy thinking how stupid he was, but he was smart. He was asking all the right questions because he wanted to know the exact same thing, which is how would he run this business right. if he had to run it, if we invested. So uh, always don't be afraid to ask questions in any situation, even these IG lives. You want, when I do a podcast and I ask questions, I want to look stupid. I don't, if I'm trying to prove how smart I am, then I'm not gonna get all the information from the guest who's on the podcast because I'm too busy trying to act smart and then I'm never gonna talk to this person again. So always try to act as stupid as possible because what's the flip side of that advice? The flip side is always stand next to the smartest person in the room. And if you're the smartest person in the room, you're standing in the wrong room. Yeah. So that's the advice. Uh, Someone asked about, um, and he's been asking this for a while. Uh, he is a computer scientist. Yes. And what do you recommend in that space? For what? For a computer scientist in that. Well, like, I don't know if he's young or if he's, I don't know, maybe he's just starting out, but he is a computer scientist. Well, I would start, I could, you know, it's funny because I, I went to undergrad for computer science. I went to graduate school for computer science. The first, 12 years of my career, I was programming software constantly. I definitely put in my 10,000 hours programming, but I'm not, I don't think anymore I would be able to program. I don't think, I think I've, it's been like 15 years since I've really written. Oh, computer, computer science is. Right. Is broad. Yeah, so I'm just gonna answer this how I would answer it. So uh, uh, I wish I still had my computer science skills. I don't think I do anymore really, but I do think I, the reason I wish I had those skills is because right now there are so many opportunities. If you have skills in programming, the world is your oyster. There are opportunities in big data, in AI, in drones, in self-driving, in robotics. Uh, I'm, I, I'm working with a pro, we're working with a programmer right now to create a very exciting piece of software that we're, we're building. Uh, just the key is get your waiter's pad, Start, uh, this is more important for you than anything, anybody else. Start writing your 10 ideas a day down. Within three to six months, you'll be a super nuclear idea machine and you'll start having good ideas. And then you'll start to realize, oh, I can program this and I should do it. The McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits, all designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost Box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget Buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last.